As sure as God's in Gloucester is a local proverb which emphasised the importance of religion to this medieval city. As a bustling hub on a vital trade route with Wales, religious communities began to establish themselves and tap into its growing population. One of the most important was the Augustinian Priory of Lantany Secunda. Although the Priory was originally born in Wales, war and conflict had driven its members to the safety and bright lights of the city. The canons soon began to play a vital role in the economic, social and religious life of Gloucester. Lantony became a centre for learning at a time when few could read or write. Its scholars were responsible for the creation of a very special library that is still considered one of the richest and best documented English medieval book collections in the country. But the good times couldn't last. With the dissolution and closure of the monasteries in the 1500s, Lantony's once great priory was lost forever. Amazingly, fragments of this remarkable community have survived against the odds. Although Lantony's once incredible library is now scattered across the world, some of the oldest and most precious books dating back to the 9th century are still in the UK, including here at Corpus Christi College in Oxford. They have withstood the trials and turmoils of war, disease and the destruction of Lantony itself. These surviving books provide an extraordinary view into the lives of Lantony's medieval scholars, as well as showcasing their interaction with the wider community in the city of Gloucester. But what stories can these books tell us? How were they created? And how did they survive almost certain destruction? This is the remarkable tale of the Lantony manuscripts. In the early 1100s, a Norman knight named William de Lacey was prowling the remote borderlands between England and Wales. His search brought him here, to the beautiful Vale of Iwas. It was in this stunning valley that he chose to drop the weight of his armour and shackles of his strong family name and turn to a pious and solitary religious existence. Within 20 years, the devotion of de Lacey had drawn several followers who created a religious community pursuing the Augustinian rule. Lantony Prima Priory, Prima meaning the first, was born. The remote location of the priory seemed to focus the minds of its members on its religious calling, but the land was uneasy. When William the Conqueror's son, King Henry I, died in December 1135, Welsh leaders seized the opportunity to drive out the Norman invaders. Lantony Prima was raided and its members were forced to flee back across the border to England, seeking refuge in Hereford. Returning to Wales was impossible. If the community was to survive, a new home was needed. So Eddie, who were the Augustinians and why did they choose to go to Gloucester? So the Augustinians were a religious order who followed the teachings of St Augustine and they were starting to establish religious houses in Britain in the early 12th century coming over from France. So this was the first house that they established in Wales and it was established in about 1118 and about 40 canons were brought here to set up the new house from London and Colchester. And the name Lantony, which we now call it for, for here in the Gloucester site, is actually a corruption of the original Welsh 
word for this place, which I'm not Welsh, so excuse my accent, but Llandui uh, Nant Honthi. Essentially, that means the Church of St. David's by the river Honthi, which is the river down in the, in the valley by, by the Priory. But because the religious order who came here were not Welsh themselves, they were actually Anglo-Norman, they didn't speak Welsh, so Llandui Nant Honthi was a bit of a mouthful for them. So over time, that got corrupted to Lantony. In the 1130s, this place became quite unstable because there was an uprising amongst the native Welsh population. And this was seen very much as a target because it was a, an outside incursion into the area. And so the order made a decision to temporarily move to Hereford, just over the hill, for a, a safe place to stay. And then they were actually offered a site near Gloucester, which became the Llantoni Secunda daughter house. And they set up a, a temporary residence there, which then became more established. So why was the location in Gloucester so different to here in the Vale of Iwas? So this location where Lantony Prima was set up was very much in accordance with the teachings of St Augustine, who taught the values of living in a wilderness location for a proper religious life away from the material world. So this was a very remote valley, although it did have good resources in terms of timber and land that could be farmed and the river for, for a water supply. So an ongoing community could be set up here, but in a very remote location. However, when this location became too dangerous and the decision was made to move to Gloucester, Gloucester was offered as a, a safe space with very rich agricultural land around it alongside the banks of the River Severn. So the 12th century history of the two priories contrasts the city of Gloucester, so a civilised location, with what it called the, the Rocks of Hatterall, referring to the Hatterall Ridge just above us here, which was a very rocky, remote location. It also contrasted the mighty River Severn with what it called the Lantoni Brook here, so a small river. And it also contrasted the fertile meadows of Gloucester with the barren heaths of this location. So very much trying to emphasise that Gloucester was a safe, civilised, plentiful location, whereas this was very much a marginal, difficult and dangerous place. Are there any reasons that the canons themselves might have preferred Gloucester over Verdewis? Well, there is quite a lot of evidence. Initially, Clement, who was the prior of the two priories in the later 12th century, was very much encouraging the community to come back here. They were building new structures and a new church, and he wanted this to remain as the, the religious centre for the community. But a lot of the canons were loath to come back here, partly because they did see it as very dangerous. I mean, there are lots of examples of their neighbours and the local lords actually rustling on their land and stealing their cattle and their oxen and their ploughs. There is actually an example of an incursion into one of their estates just over the hill in Newton, where two of the canons were actually killed in a struggle during that altercation. There's another example where a local Welsh lord sought refuge here in the, in the Priory and actually brought his whole household, his whole retinue and took over the whole of the Priory and the church and the accommodation and forced the canons out. So there were real valid reasons why they were very reluctant to return here once they'd established themselves in Gloucester, which was a, a much more peaceful and bountiful location. Lantony in Gloucester, commonly known as Secunda or the Second, to distinguish from Prima in Wales, was soon playing a critical role in the town. The presence of skilled and educated religious scholars was pretty quickly having an effect on the local community. From 1199, a school was established in Gloucester, which Lantony was granted the licence to run. It was described as a place to which scholars flock for the sake of learning, some from our own diocese and others from diverse parts. Most importantly, Lantony was granted vast lands both here in Gloucester and as far afield as Ireland. The rents and produce from this land provided a vital income to the Priory. Such was the extent of Lantony's urban estates that their size far exceeded any other Augustinian house outside of London. 
A powerful demonstration of this is the 15th century manorial barn that still stands on the Lantani Secunda site today. Barns such as this were built in the days when tenant farmers would provide one-tenth of their crop to the church. Their contributions would be stacked and stored within these barns during the threshing period and to protect them from the winter elements. Manorial barns such as this clearly demonstrate Lantani's wealth and power. To enable Lantani to record and administer its vast estates, scholars were considered essential. At a time when most of the population were illiterate, the ability to read and write was seen as a superpower. But how was this information recorded and where was it stored? So John, how did Lantony record its land holdings? The Priory owned around 50 manors and 100 parish churches all the way through Britain, uh, England, Wales and Ireland, I should say. In Ireland, where the Priory had about 50 churches from which it collected tithes, there were two canons permanently stationed with their own mini priory at Dulique in County Meath. It also had about 230 blocks of houses in Gloucester, so it possessed thousands of title deeds and leases recording them. The originals were filed in chests and have been lost, but what we've still got are 12 volumes into which the canons copied them out with indexes for quick reference. We've also got their handy guides to the properties in Gloucester and Ireland saying what was in each place and exactly where it was. So with all of those properties they had to keep a track of, John, they must have needed a really sound basis in an education. Can you tell me a bit more about why education was so important in medieval times? Education was the job of the church and not of the state in the Middle Ages. So within 20 years of its foundation, Lantoni Priory had a royal charter under which it ran a grammar school in Gloucester. The school lasted for 400 years. There were also two schools at the Priory itself, mostly for choir boys in the Priory church. For the youngest boys, there was a song school where they learnt to read the words of the service books as well as the music. There was also a grammar school for the older boys. Teaching was in the language of the church, which was Latin. On top of all that, the priory always kept a canon as a student at Oxford, where he did a foundation course in rhetoric, logic, maths and astronomy, followed by a specialised course in theology or law or medicine. The canon who studied medicine could run the Priory Infirmary and all the others would be, if they stood the full course, would be able to talk intelligently to the nobility and royalty who came to stay at the Priory from time to time. So with that in mind then, John, how important are these documents to giving us that insight into medieval life at the Priory? As well as the deeds, the Priory records include contracts and memoranda which give a wealth of detail. They tell us that in the 15th century, the Priory had 24 canons, but also 80 lay servants living on the Priory site. They tell us about the Priory organ, which a young boy was taught to play. They tell us about the Priory clock, the bells and the carillon, for which an expert was fetched out from Gloucester to repair them. You wouldn't expect that level of detail, would you, really? No, um, no, So to be indeed. able to see that is really, really fascinating. How rare is it to have documents like this survive to the present day? The 
major churches, medieval cathedrals, are fairly well documented. What's so unusual is to have a detailed record of life in a monastery in, of the middle rank, like Antonio Priory. Nearly all of the Prior's registers, such as we have at Antony Priory, have disappeared from virtually all other Augustinian houses. It's, it really is unique. Despite the Priory's substantial estates and income, Lantony's primary purpose was as a religious community dedicated to sharing the message of God. The canon's reading and writing skills were crucial to this. Books carrying and analysing the Word of God were critical to religious communities, so building up a library of key texts was a priority. The majority of the surviving books created and collected by the Priory date to within its first 100 years, during which time it amassed a sizeable collection. Works in the Lantony libraries covered a rich and varied range of subjects, including medicine, grammar, religious tracts, hagiography and classical scholarship. When in 1205 it was decided to separate Prima in Wales from Secunda in Gloucester, all the property belonging to both Lantonies was divided up, and this could have included the books. Lantony Secunda was now free to manage its own affairs. This newfound independence, along with its growing collection of books, saw Lantony continue to flourish. In a time before the printing press, the word of the Lord, the Gospels, had to be handwritten. Religious books created by the scholars were works of art, embellished and coloured to celebrate the glorious words within. But how were these books created and how were they written? So Kirsty, why would a priory like Lantony Secunda need a library of books? Well, Christianity has at its heart a book, the Bible, which contains um, the Word of God. And the bread and butter of the Lantony community would have been to study and to muse upon the meaning of the Bible. The daily life of the community was dominated by a cycle of church services, both day and night. And so also the canons would have needed the books that contain the readings, the prayers, the music for those services. And the book we see here in front of us is an example of such a book mm -hmm. dating from the 14th century. You can see here that we have the opening of a prayer in honour of St Kynberg, mm -hmm. who was a local saint who was significant to Lantony. So this is a rare example of a surviving mm. service book from Lantony Secunda. Those sorts of books, biblical books, um, theological commentaries, are the type of books which survive in the greatest numbers from Lantony Secunda. But the library catalogue that was made there in the 14th century reveals the collection at that time as a whole and tells us that the canons also collected other sorts of books which don't necessarily survive to the present day. For example, the catalogue shows lots of legal books. The canons would have needed a good understanding of law in order to manage their properties to resolve any disputes that occurred. Medical books also appear in the catalogue. Canons had a pastoral duty of care for the sick, both their own members of the community and the local townspeople of Gloucester. Mm -hmm. The library catalogue also lists a number of grammatical and classical texts, which would have been important both for the canon's own learning and for use in mm -hmm. the school, which the canons of Lantony Secunda were responsible for running in Gloucester from 1199 onwards. So did the canons at Lantony make their own books? Well, the way in which the fledgling Lantony community obtained its first books is uncertain, but it's likely that the early canons begged or borrowed um, the books they could. Of course, once they moved to the urban centre of Gloucester, um, the community started to settle, it gained extra lands, it became more prosperous, and all of that would have meant that there was more resources available to invest in book production. Copying books was a recognised duty of canons at this time, and Involvement in brick production was a prestigious occupation for a canon. Copying out sacred words and being involved in creating these precious resources was um, seen as a sacred task. So particularly interesting when considering um, the books that Lantony manufactured itself in the 12th century is a group of about 14 or so survivors, of which we have two examples here. And very importantly, they share a particular style of script and of decoration, which is closely similar across all of the members of the group. 
For example, if you look in the interior mm -hmm. of this initial, I don't know if you can see, there's some very fine yeah. fringing yeah. on the interior of it. That's a feature that's found across this group of books and is not common in books from other centres. So it's a particular lantern-y decorative feature. And this level of uniformity tells us a couple of important things about the community. Firstly, to achieve this level of uniformity meant that the canons at Lantony had a number of trained scribes who were working in an organised fashion, probably under the leadership of somebody who had a particular look of the books that they wished to create. And they turned that into a scheme to produce decent library copies of standard texts which would serve the community for the rest of its lifetime in fact. And how long might um, a book of this size for example take to copy? Copying could only be done when the weather allowed it and during okay. daylight or by candlelight in the long British winters and so these books would have taken many weeks possibly months to copy and so they were a really significant investment of time for the community as well. Okay, so if I was a, a canon at Lantani Secunda and I wanted to make a book, how would I go about it? Well, in medieval times, you would not have been able to go down to the nearest bookshop or download a copy of an ebook as you might be able to do today. Your first task would have been to find a copy of the book that you wanted mm -hmm. because you would have had to copy from that copy yourself. Having done that, you would have then had to source the materials that you needed with which to make your book. Medieval books were written not on the paper with which we're familiar today, but on animal skin known as parchment or vellum. Your inks would have been next. Here in this 12th century Lantony book, we can see that there's a brownish black ink used for the text mm -hmm. and a green and red ink used for the decoration. These could have been made from vegetables, from crushed up insects, from red lead or white lead, or lapis lazuli for blue. And you would have used a quill pen, probably made from the feather of a swan or a goose with which to write your book. Once you had written out your text and added any decoration that you could afford to add, you would have bound your finished pages together into a book form. And if you could afford to, you would have added a binding to them to protect them. But this is a really important binding because many medieval book bindings were lost at, um, often at the dissolution when their new owners wanted to put their own bindings on the books they'd inherited from monastic libraries. And often they discarded the old bindings, the old medieval bindings. So bindings from Lantony Secunda are really rare and this is a really important survivor. Did the production of books change across the lifetime of Lantony Secunda at all? So firstly, there's evidence that from the later 1100s, um, Lantony Secunda began to employ professional scribes to make books, which is something that other local communities in Herefordshire and Gloucestershire were also doing at the same mm -hmm. time. Another significant avenue by which the canons began to acquire books was via connections with the university world, which at that time was centred upon Paris and here at Oxford. Religious communities began to send canons to study at university, and as with any university course, it was supported by textbooks, uh, which canons would have needed to buy or borrow to aid their studies. So this that we have here is an example of one such book. It dates from the 13th century and it contains a standard history of the Bible, which mm -hmm. was one of the core texts on the university curriculum. So it's the work of professional scribes who would have specialised in this type of complex text and would have lived and worked in the vicinity mm -hmm. of the universities. So it's unknown how this particular book um, made its way back to Lantony or which canon brought it back, but it would have probably come back to the community with a canon who'd finished his studies. Another significant source of books throughout the Priory's history was actually donations, which could be a lovely bonus to the community, mm. the receipt of books that they hadn't had to fund themselves or write themselves. And a very significant one occurred in the later 1300s when Master John Leach of North Leach in Gloucestershire bequeathed 57 mostly legal texts to the community. That is a really significant donation of books at a time when a university college library like the one we're standing in now might have only had a couple of hundred books mm -hmm. in its collection. And finally, we should give an honourable mention to the new technology of printing, which would of course come to revolutionise book production. There are two printed books associated with Lantony, which indicates that the new technology had been encountered by the canons by the time of the dissolution, but that they had not necessarily felt the need to embrace it enthusiastically, given that they had a really solid collection 
um, of several hundred manuscript books behind them. One of the key aspects of the documents and manuscripts that make up the Lantini collection is the insight that it gives us into the lives of the people who once called the Priory home. One of the most central characters is Clement of Lantini. A native to Gloucester, Clement became a canon and a scholar at an early age. He rose to the rank of prior, firstly at Prima in Wales and then later at Secunda in Gloucester. Clement oversaw a spike in book production in the mid-12th century and was a prolific writer himself. One of his most celebrated works is Unum Ex Cator, or One From Four, which became the standard synopsis of and commentary on the Gospels, both in medieval England and on the continent. Clement himself is celebrated for his piercing wit, sound judgment, solid faith, and his simple but eloquent writing style. In the Lantony Collection, held at Corpus Christi College in Oxford, is a truly magical glimpse into music and culture in medieval Gloucester. Hidden within the pages of one of the surviving books is a very special piece of music, which has become known as the Lantony Carol. So Caroline, what is the Lantony Carol? Well, the Lantony Carol is a chance scrap of manuscript that has been bound into this volume, which we know was given to the library at Clantony Secunda uh, around about the early years of the 14th century, so the 1300s. So at some point, somebody has carefully written out this lovely song. I mean, we think of carols as Christmas carols, mm. but then a carol simply meant a song, really. So a song to be sung any time. And it's a song to the Virgin Mary. It's called Edi Be Thou, um, Hail to Thee, Heavenly Queen, written in Old English. So uh, my pronunciation probably isn't very good, but written in Old English, which dies out very soon after. This is not the English of Chaucer. It's an even earlier version of English. So we know that this is a very, very old carol. And I think from my understanding that there's something a bit unusual about the harmony in this, in this particular carol. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yes, it, the, the harmonies of this carol are really interesting and they were commented upon at the time by contemporaries. Gerald of Wales, for example, commented upon about the music in the marches at the time was their use of more than one voice. So I think particularly for what we call vernacular songs, songs that everybody was singing in English, many of them would have only had one line of tune. Here in the Lantony Carol, you can see that there are in fact two lines, lines for two voices in the mm. music. We've got this one at the top, which is essentially carrying the tune. So mm -hmm. that's what we would call the soprano line, if you like. And then below, murmuring gently below is the alto line that's acting as a kind of aural accompaniment to the main tune. And this was sort of remarked upon by contemporary chroniclers and, and so on as being an unusual feature of the Welsh marches and the kind of singing that the Welsh did. And it also tells us another thing because in early Scandinavian music, so Nor Norwegian and Danish music, you get this similar use of thirds. And so what contemporaries thought and indeed musicologists today agree as well is that possibly this is somehow an echo of the years when the Vikings and the Danes swept through Britain mm. and particularly came down the West. So that too is a very interesting fact that we can learn about the Lantony Carol. There's so much that we can glean of information from the day in this little page of, of script. Are there any particular occasions when this carol would have been sung and is there anything that we can learn from the lyrics? This is in the language of the people on the streets and in the fields. It's English, it's not highbrow Norman. Mm. It's not the Latin that the canons would have used in their own worship and their own choral singing. This is 
for the people and of the people. And the language that is used about the Virgin Mary is, is joyous and it's very personal, it's very intimate. We perhaps forget that for the people living in the Middle Ages, the saints and the Virgin Mary, they were almost like real people. You know, they were almost like our present day celebrities perhaps. And we can imagine it being sung on feast days, perhaps even in taverns mm. and echoing through the streets of Gloucester sometimes. I'm sure the common man had many songs that he sang, but very, very few of them have come down to us. And, and this is what makes the Lanthony Carol so special. The 14th century began disastrously for Lantani Secunda. The Priory Church with its four bell towers and nine bells was destroyed in a devastating fire that would necessitate a costly rebuild. But worse was to come. With the outbreak of the Black Death in 1349, 19 of the 30 canons succumbed to the pandemic. This is reflected in the library collections, with a lower number of surviving books dating from this period, demonstrating the uncertainty and unrest that hung over Lantony and the people of Gloucester as the surviving canons came together to save the Priory. These upheavals, however, resulted in the creation of a series of documents that attempted to set the affairs of the community in order by listing the Priory's assets, including its books, five registers listing the Prior's daily activity, and several cartularies, or volumes, documenting the Priory's business and property. The survival of such material is extremely rare and provides a wealth of information into Lantani Secunda's daily administration. Not least the fact that by this time, the Priory had many more books in its collection than have now survived from its entire history. In the years that followed, Lantony was able to recover and prosper. Nothing demonstrates this rebirth more than in 1481 when King Edward IV granted the struggling Lantony Prima over to Lantony Secunda. So now in a complete reversal of fortune, Prima became a cell of its own daughter house. Lantony Secunda's final years were prosperous, so much so that it could arguably be called the richest Augustinian house in England. The Priory Church was rebuilt, and many of the precious buildings that still stand on the Secunda site today date from the 15th and early 16th centuries. When we stand on the site of Lantani Secunda Priory today, it can be difficult to envisage what this once great religious institution would have looked like. So profound are the changes in the years since the dissolution of the monasteries and the closure of Lantany. The site itself has been transformed. During the English Civil War, Gloucester's parliamentarian defenders ordered the demolition of the Priory Church Tower to deny the besieging royalists a vantage point over the city. Many of its remaining buildings were damaged during the fighting as the royalist guns pounded Gloucester's walls in a vain attempt to take the city. In the 1700s, a new canal would slice straight through the land where the Great Priory Church once stood. Much damage was done during the 1840s with the construction of a quay and railway yard by the Gloucester and Dean Forest Railway Company. Today, the railway yard and the screech of wagons are long gone, replaced by a new college campus for local students. But hidden beneath the centuries of development are the fragments of Lantani Secunda. Through the dedicated work of archaeologists and by using the surviving fragments of buildings, 
we can attempt to recreate how the Priory may have looked at its height during the Tudor period for the first time in almost 500 years. One of these precious surviving traces include the western boundary wall of the site and its gatehouse. These were built in brick, which today we think of as rather commonplace, but in Tudor times they were considered very modern and impressive. Further east, parts of the western and southern sides of the Priory's great court and much of the manorial barn also survive. The southern gatehouse of the Great Court was found by archaeologists a few years ago and has now been preserved beneath the ground under some modern-day retirement flats. The churchyard and northern gatehouse of the Great Court was discovered when the new college was constructed in 2004. Beyond the gatehouse, archaeologists uncovered a number of buildings, which are probably part of a complex of structures near the cloister. The church itself is now long gone, but its remains may have been found by workmen in 1846 to the north of the Great Court during construction work for a new dock. The reconstruction of the church here is based upon surviving examples of a similar date elsewhere, including from the fragments of the Priory Church at Lantony Prima. Likewise, the cloister and enclosed space to the south of the church are based on other known examples. This element of the reconstruction is an interpretation, but it does give a good idea of the sheer scale of the church, how impressive and imposing it must have seemed to locals and visitors, and how much has been lost today. To the east, the Lantony Secunda Priory estate extended as far as the Bristol Road and contained gardens, orchards and a mill. So little of the original site still survives today, but this reconstruction can give us some idea of the wealth and grandeur of Lantony Secunda Priory just before the dissolution, which was to change its fate forever. So Andy, can you please tell me a little bit about what happened to Lantony during the dissolution? Well, Henry VIII is seeking to establish himself as the head of the Church of England. And as part of this, he wants to undertake the dissolution of all the monasteries, friaries and nunneries in the kingdom. And he wants to do this really for two reasons. The first reason is that all those monks, friars and nuns owe their allegiance to the Pope in Rome, and Henry can't have that. And the other probably more compelling reason is that collectively, all these institutions own a huge amount of land. And Henry wants that land, and he wants the income from that land. So he instructs his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, to undertake the dissolution of all those monasteries, nunneries, and friaries. And at Lantony, the prior and canons submit to royal authority in 1538. They're released from their vows, and then they leave the priory grounds. We know, for example, that the prior was given a pension for the rest of his life, but we don't know what became of the canons. The site itself is then sold to a private individual who almost certainly converts some of the buildings into a manor house. Lantony Church then becomes a parish church. With the closure and destruction of so many religious institutions, what happened to their precious libraries? Well, of course, England now has a different religion. So, so many of these books in the friaries and monasteries are now potentially almost heretical or certainly contrary to the, the new approved faith. And indeed, many of the books dealing with the order of service or with music in church might no longer be acceptable either. We have a new order of service. We have a different musical tradition. So these books may have been destroyed for exactly that reason. So many of these books might be highly decorated, covered with expensive materials, and those may well have been ripped off the covers of books 
during the dissolution as part of the cash grab that was the dissolution of the monasteries. And that, of course, would have destroyed them. Equally, I think we mustn't forget the kind of anarchy of the dissolution, with buildings being pulled down, people being dispersed far and wide, other buildings being rebuilt. There's huge potential for books to be lost or just mislaid and, and left to rot. So what happened to Lantony's library? Well, we're not entirely sure, but what we think happened is this. We think the last prior of Lantony, Richard Hart, might have taken many of the books at Lantony when he left the priory. We don't know if he had permission to do that or whether he just felt he had a moral right to the books. But certainly on his death, a large part of the Lantony collection passes into the possession of his brother-in-law, a man by the name of John Freyer. And they remain in the possession of the Freyer family for two generations before being purchased by the Archbishop of Canterbury for his new library at Lambeth. But also, smaller groups of Lantony manuscripts made their way into other institutions, including Corpus Christi in Oxford. Those particular books were the gift of one Henry Parry, a fellow of Corpus from 1614. Parry had a number of connections with Gloucester, and it's probable that his collection had remained in the local area. So why is Lantony's collection so special as a rare survivor? Well, there are a number of reasons why the manuscripts from Lantony matter so much. Firstly, they're very early. The high proportion of the manuscripts from Lantony date from the 12th century, and that's really unusual when compared with other friaries or monasteries. They give us a really important insight into the early period of friary existence in England. They give us a great insight into the administration, the everyday views, and the spiritual attitude of those institutions. Secondly, this is an Augustinian priory, and their records tend to be very bad. So we have this extraordinary survival at Lantony, which is giving us an insight into a community we would otherwise know very little about. Thirdly, Lantony is unusual because it had two sites. We have Lantony Prima in Wales, and we have Lantony Secunda in England. And that allows us this remarkable opportunity to compare organisation, ecclesiastical attitudes and spirituality between medieval Wales and medieval England. And that's the most remarkable opportunity to understand the differences between the two countries in the medieval period. And the last reason this collection is so important is actually rather counterintuitive. You see, it's because these are ordinary documents. During the dissolution, so many manuscripts and documents were preserved because they were exceptional. They were particularly beautifully written or wonderfully illuminated. But because of the fluke of survival we have at Lantony, we have a brilliant window into ordinary, everyday life in medieval England. And that simply doesn't survive elsewhere. And that's why it's such a precious record that tells us so much about our history. The Lantony manuscripts are vitally important survivors. Not only do they provide a fascinating window into the lives of the canons in Prima in Wales and Secunda in Gloucester, but they also give an insight into the Priory's impact on the lives of the people in Gloucester itself. Whether it's through their religious teachings, meticulous record things, or in the words of the Lantony Carol, collections such as Lantony's shine a light into a time little known by many. They bring to life buildings and communities which may no longer exist, but which allow us to learn more about where we came from and who we are today. No to to God has said, on the licht of the heaven the dew, of the strong through heady bled, the Holy Ghost here upon the Sioux. No bring a sort of power of dread that ever bitterly hurts through. Who shall to sing to heaven a lead, well as sweet as the ear can do. Mother full of fairest hand, mind and ray and well he taught. He can be in the love of band, and to the his army draws. Do me shield of from the hand, as though a crow and wilt and walks. Help me to believers end, and mark me with the sun of